Hi, I'm Dr. Deepak Oil with the College of Biomedical Science at Larkin University. This presentation is on behalf of the South Florida Geriatric Workforce Education Program on Gambling Disorder. I have no disclosures to present, however, I do want to take this time to let you know and acknowledge that this presentation is sponsored by the grant funding from the HRSA. The project again was the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. Our principal investigator is Dr. Noshira Bandia. Our administrative director is Dr. Sweta Tawari. Learning objectives is, first of all, we're going to have is to define our gambling disorder, how to screen for gambling disorder, how to manage our patient, and of course, available resources that you can use. Gambling, what is it? It's a very old, common activity that has been around for thousands of years. Yes, I said thousands. Believe it or not, it's been around for thousands. It comes in various different forms. You probably don't think of some of these as gambling, but here we go. Cards, dice, slot machines, various casino games, sporting events, carnival games, elections, lottery games, contests, etc. Yeah, you're probably thinking, elections? How can elections be gambling? Well, if there is anything out there where I or you or someone can bet or wager on and it results in some sort of monetary gain, it's a form of gambling. Think about it this way. When we were kids, I don't know when you guys grew up, but pogs or marbles, we used to play that on the playground. If you would lose, you would have to either lose your marbles or lose a bunch of pogs, for example. That's actually gambling too, because it's a game. But we don't think of it that way. Funny, right? Why is it a problem? It becomes a problem when the individual with the disorder cannot stop themselves. In the geriatric population, they were found to have a larger numbers but this was found to be secondary to boredom. Hmm. In 1975, 35% of people, 65 and older, had gambled in their lifetime. Here's the crazy part. By 1998, that number grew astronomically to 80%. Now, it's estimated that almost half the adults by the time that they are 65 have gambled. Isn't that something? Gambling disorder diagnostic criteria per the DSM-5. So I have laid out here the, all the criteria that you're going to find in the DSM-5. You can always be uh, just refer to your own personal copy. But the biggest points that I want to make of this is it's got to be persistent and recurrent problematic behavior that's leading to a significant impairment or it's causing distress. And remember, you have to have four of these, of these uh, categories listed within a 12-month period. Once you see that, Please, take a little deeper look at your patient. Reasons for gambling. The younger population sees gambling as a method to amass wealth. For example, poker tournaments, we see it, poker stars, poker 21, whatever else is out there. The elderly population, on the other hand, they see going to the casino as an acceptable activity. Now, you're thinking to yourself, why would grandpa and grandma want to go to the casino? Hmm. Well, it helps them maintain social relationships. Think about it. Their kids are gone. You're doing your own thing. They, they want to have something to do. So it helps maintain that relationship. Well, maybe they're single now, right? Well, it gives them entertainment as well. It provides excitement. It provides them a chance to mingle with other people. Because that's how we get to know everybody else. That's how we like to enjoy ourselves. We as human beings are social creatures. Right? Being cooped up or locked up in a pandemic, for example, yeah, it caused people distress. Why? Because we are social creatures by habit. So that's a, one of the major reasons why the elderly people like seeing, see it as a uh, normal thing to do. How do we screen for gambling? While this is often difficult because it does not readily present as a chief complaint, there is a LIE slash BET questionnaire like the CAGE questionnaire that are used to help a clinician. Now remember, BET is not your network, okay? Just wanna throw that out there. So the question is, have you ever had to lie to people important to you about how much you gambled? Or have you ever felt a need to bet more money? Whichever one of these two questions you use, it does not matter, why? Because a single positive answer on either one of these is 99% sensitive and over 85% specific for gambling. 
Treatment. While no treatment or medication truly exists for this condition, most of it is directed at the comorbid condition. Bipolar disorder, for example. OCD, ADHD, depression and substance abuse. They all can sometimes go hand in hand with this. SSRI medications such as, you know, Prozac, sertraline, what have you, are commonly used and have found to be effective, but, you know, further research is needed as the initial sample sizes were small. That's kind of the biggest thing that you're gonna find. So if you're out there, you wanna do your own research, this could be a nice area for you to look into. The primary approach for gambling is going to be psychotherapy. You guessed it, group therapy. Things like CBT, which is your cognitive behavioral therapy or family therapy. All of these types are types of psychotherapy that are going to help your patient. Example, how? You're going to have the patient understand that they do not control chance or outcomes. How many times have you gone to a blackjack table of thought, if I sit here or here, if I take this card or this card, I can make sure that I'm gonna win and the house is gonna lose, right? That's a false sense. But that's what we have to make sure that these patients realize, that they do not control it. Desensitization to the audio and visual stimulation of the machines, think about it. If you go to Vegas, you don't put coins in the slot anymore, right? It's a ticket that comes out and you push a button. Some of them you'll still find will have the lever, but that again is that whole um, sensitivity part that that's what we like to do. That's our motor skills, right? We like to see all of that. So those are kind of the things that we have to stop. That's why we have to desensitize the patient. Resources. There are two major resources that you can use. You have, of course, Gamblers Anonymous. That's a group therapy thing that you can do. Or you can also call the National Council of Problem Gambling. The number there is on your screen, as is the website. What they will do is they will get you in touch with somebody locally or in your area that can get you to a meeting and get you further help. I do hope that you enjoyed my presentation today. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you again. I hope you enjoyed.